and welcome to my channel. I'm Fornax and this is part one of my five part review of the story elements of Living World season four, All or Nothing. So we are starting at the beginning, as it were, with the champion and scion. Now this will be a fairly deep dive into the story, the lore behind it, and some speculation about any deeper meaning and future narrative direction. So need less to say, but I'm going to say it anyway. Huge spoilers ahead, massive spoilers ahead, all the spoilers. You have been warned. If you have not played through this episode in its totality, in respect of the story, go away, play it, enjoy it, hug a friend, come back and see me. And a few caveats before we begin. All this is just my personal take on things. I have no insider knowledge, zero, and being completely honest with you, it is vanishingly rare for any predictions that I have made about the story to come to pass. So temper your expectations appropriately. Okay, so I think we can finally begin. Champion and Scion starts as many episodes nowadays do, with a calm chat between the player character and Kaith. Yet, but don't worry. Sometimes she goes off alone when she feels troubled. Always has, always comes back. I do have an update on our conversation at Sun's Refuge though. I'm following up on the dwarves. Still convinced they know something about Glint's legacy? More than ever. I came to ask Ogden in person, but it seems the Priory isn't keen on a known thief roaming their halls. So we are directed to the Priory, and its petrified dwarven magister Ogden Stonehealer. Why the dwarves are stone, and the story of Ogden, I am happy to make a lore video about if anyone is interested, let me know in the comments below. But as we arrive at the Priory, before we dive into the instance, Kate has a little bit of dialogue for us. Before we go in, there's something I need to say. All that time I spent guarding the egg, watching over Irene as a hatchling in Taria. You raised her. But then she had you, and it felt like she didn't need me anymore. So I stepped away. Kaith. No, let me say this. What's coming is dangerous. Aureen is terrified. I can feel it. She's going to need us. Both of us. Then it's a good thing we're both here. Come on, let's go have that talk with Ogden. Now, Kate is one of the original companion heroes from Vanilla and has played many vital roles in our journey of us far. Now, I have done a rambling lore video about Kate. Links in the top right hand corner of the screen for that if anyone's interested. It's a brief history of her life and her story so far, but in brief here, much, much briefer, her past actions have cast doubt on her morality and integrity, and now she is seeking redemption and has sworn herself protector of Aurene and single mindedly dedicated herself to the Scion of Glint. How successful Kate's redemption arc will be, I guess, is left to personal opinion. Now, we're heading into Priory itself, and many notable moments have taken place in the inner sanctum, known as the Special Collection of the Priory and its vault, which is almost like a secret inside a secret, a story beat which is often echoed in the Guild Wars universe. With the cave at our side, we find Ogden waiting. That's all three signs. I'm due for a visit. Does About time you showed up. We're going to Thunderhead Keep. We are? To Glint's Dragon's Blood Forge. How else are we going to kill Krautgatorik? A new Dragon's Blood Spear. You lost the first one? Not now. For Orin to destroy the Crystal Dragon, Scion and Champion must first prove themselves. There's an extension of Glint's lair protected in the mists, a refuge for her scion. From there, you can enter her trials. Oh, good. More trials. Why didn't you mention any of this before? We were waiting for the signs. 
Glint's egg hatching, the Lich's death, and the sands of Glint's hourglass have begun to glow. Her scions already in the refuge. Go to Orin, complete the trials. I'll get the word out and meet you at Thunderhead Keep with the pact. A very enigmatic little bit of dialogue there, which I think is easy to overlook. And the question for me is, does Ogden have knowledge of another prophecy of Glint? The Three Signs. Now, veterans of the franchise will know of Glint's Flame Seeker prophecies. And if you didn't play the original game and want to know all about them, again, top right hand corner of the screen, there is a three part law series which covers the Flame Seeker prophecies from start to finish. But despite our knowledge of her old prophecy, we do not know if there are other prophecies Glint made. And to me, it looks very much like we are living through another gigantic prophecy. But nothing more is eluded here, and our character does not inquire about the three signs, which narratively is fairly weak. We are here seeking all the knowledge we can of Glint and her legacy from one of the last dwarves, at least on the surface of Tyria, there could be countless in the bowels of the planet, which in itself is another lore video. Again, let me know in the comments if you want me to explore that. But here, in this story moment, we don't ask, we don't inquire, we simply plow on into the next part of the story. Now we are jumping into Glint's lab, but the hourglass itself is also interesting. It looks different from the last time we saw it. I could be wrong, perhaps it was a different hourglass. Perhaps it evolved as events in the world played out. Perhaps this is some sort of lore easter egg that I'm missing. Let me know in the comments if you've caught it, but nevertheless, we are transported to an area of Glint's lair which is hidden in the mists. I really enjoyed our sojourns into this lair in previous episodes. It's always beautiful and as ever, the environmental artists have done a spectacular job with the art here. It's breathtaking. Please, please, devs, if you are listening to any of my videos, please make a Glint's Lair themed guild hall. Oh my goodness, that would be just epic. Anyway, fan girl fantasies aside, what we find here is a heart-breaking scene. Mother and daughter's first meeting in the most tragic of circumstances. Aureen is huddled against the still form of her mother's lifeless body. This for me was a genuinely emotive moment. I did shed a tear here. I am a complete softie, but I'm sure I'm not the only one. Cry emojis in the comments if you need a hug after this story moment too. This scene really made me look at Aureen and think about things quite deeply. Aureen is a child, an orphan, not only has she lost her mother and her brother, but the last member of her family, her grand sire, is hell-bent on her destruction. That in and of itself would be a burden most individuals would buckle under. No matter how many caretakers fussed over her, her life was never her own. She is a youngster shackled to a legacy thrust upon her by her mother. She is surrounded by beings alien to her, who see her as a pet, or a tool, or a threat. Very few see her as the sentient being she is, with hopes and fears and a mind as intricate and agile as any human, char, non asura or silvari, perhaps even more complex, given her lineage. Aureen, we haven't thought much about all this from your perspective, have we? This legacy killed your mother, killed your brother, and that vision of it killing you. But I know one thing for certain, Glint would never tell you to do this if there was no hope. You're not alone. We'll all be with you. This isn't only on your shoulders. 
Well, if you're both ready... So we comfort Aureen to the best of our ability, and then the player and Aureen face a set of trials. Now the first trials we faced were vying to be Aureen's champion back in the golden city of Tyria. But now the player character helps Aureen gain the power she needs to face her grandfather in three trials. My, my followers and I developed the resonance crystals that made possible the dragon's blood spear. Creating the crystals, forging the spear, these acts required the channeling of powerful magic. And this is a very interesting part of the story, because we learn how to forge crystal spears. We aid Aureen in consuming more power and discover how to gather and harness the branded corruption to aid our fight. And then we face off against Aureen's greatest fear. I am. You fear what Krakatoric might make of you, champion. You fear for her survival and the world's. Help one another. Find courage together. Which is not a death. It is being branded, corrupted, turned into an instrument of violence and death at the command of Kraukatoric. And after defeating the Shade of Aureen, this happens. Sion, my beloved child. There are things about Ascension that can only be expressed between dragons. Ascension was an integral part of the storyline of Guild Wars prophecies. So veteran players like myself, we know this topic fairly well because as players we undertook the trials of Ascension. The last part of our trial being a battle with our doppelganger. Which if that sounds familiar, that's what we've just done with Aureen. We just took part in Aureen's right of ascension. So she is on the path to transcending the mortal plane and entering the sphere of divinity. Now, we were not privy to that conversation between Aureen and Glint, but I think this part of the story is vital to understand what could, could happen in the next living world installment. Now I want to head back to Glint's remains. Tragically, she is even beautiful in death, living crystal. But when we look at Aureen, she is very much flesh and blood. And I do not think Aureen has achieved her final form. I think the part of the process of her ascension is casting off the flesh and evolving into a more ethereal or transcended form, like that of her mother Glint. Now, if you think back to the bloodstones, these were great crystalline structures capable of holding vast amounts of power. So perhaps Ori needs to cast off her mortal form so she is capable of holding and mediating the balance of power in our world. Now, before we leave Glint's site, we are taken to another chamber. And here, Glint tells us this. With you, champion, I share my true legacy and Krakatoric's greatest secret. He foresaw the possibility of a world at peace. A world without strife between dragons and mortals. A world without him. It terrified him. He demanded I help prevent it from coming to pass. But, but where he saw doom, I saw a gift to the world. This fragile, powerful hope. But what my daughter must do will seem impossible to her. Now, what I take away from these comments is not that our victory is guaranteed over Krakatoric because he has prophesied it. Because if you think back to previous conversations with Glint, she sees possibilities, possible futures ahead. And her powers are limited. Now, one would imagine that Kraukatoric 
has even greater prophetic powers than Glint, so he saw a possibility of our victory. And even Glint herself says that it is a fragile hope of a better world. So, I don't think it's guaranteed. I don't necessarily know whether it's going to play out as Glint hopes or how she has planned for it too. And only time will tell if my theory of Aureen's ascension is anywhere near the mark. This part of the story, Champion and Scion, ends with our arrival at Thunderhead Keep, and there is an interesting bit of dialogue from the Zaishan priestess of Balthazar, Zafira. I can feel him. Ah, right. You haven't met Aureen in person. I never expected to feel his presence again. And in a dragon. She's a very special dragon. I'll let you all get acquainted while I track down Ogden. So, what is my overall take on Scion and Champion? Firstly, I enjoyed interacting with Ogden and welcome more dialogue from this stoic and secretive elder. I feel more sympathetic towards Kaith. Her dedication to Aureen is clear, but I would have liked to have had at least a few story moments of her interior with Aureen. It's the show not tell aspect of storytelling which is super important, but there are constraints with narrative in video games, which I completely understand. Now, Seeing the body of Glint was touching for me, but I'm not sure how many others will feel it as deeply as I did. I think you need to have played the original game, or at least read Destiny's Edge, where the death of this most enigmatic and much-loved being is dramatised. Links below if you're interested to that book. Having completed all the story of All or Nothing, it is clear that in many ways this episode is a training run for the final confrontation in the Crystal Dragon. It also gives hope that the events of that infamous episode are not as immutable as we may have initially been led to believe. Of course, I could be completely and utterly wrong. I really hope I'm not, though. <laughs> I live in hope. So that's it, my breakdown slash review of Champion and Scion's story, and if you enjoyed this, rejoice, for I will be making a review of each story step of All or Nothing. If you enjoyed this video, please like and share, and show some love to Molini, Hain, Christopher Martin, Cobb, Jolly Joe Star, Ada, Sarah Zoo, Dark Griever, and all my wondrous patrons without whom I would be unable to dedicate the time and resources I do to my content creation. I can never thank them enough. Now, if you feel inspired and want to jump into Path of Fire or any of the Guild Wars 2 games, there are referral links below. Thanks to the generosity of ArenaNet and their partner program, of whom I am a proud affiliate, using any of these links directly supports my channel. The next review will be of Dragon's Blood, where we will dive into the lore of Thunderhead Keep. So please come and join me for that. But until then, as always, thanks for watching.